Ladies and gentlemen, joining me now was a Heisman finalist, a second overall pick in the NFL draft, a man whose life might have got off the tracks just a little bit, but has come all the way back. Now he's inspiring a nation, doing great things, renaming his legacy, ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Leaf. Let's go. <laughs> well, what an, intro what an introduction. Well, you know, I, you you should probably get into media. I was thinking huh. about it, and we'll talk yeah. about where I met you at a super media event. But I honestly, right before we went live there, I was going to go into Wikipedia to kind of get some stats and facts, and you told me not to use that because it's all bullshit. Do you hate the Wikipedia page for Ryan Leaf? I haven't looked at it that often, but I uh, I, I think I looked at it in the past. I just it, it can be randomly just commented on or, or by anybody so i don't know how truthful it really is uh so you probably should just come right to the source you got <laughs> well, my phone number right well i can respect that a lot let's chat about <laughs> it whenever i got to the college football seminar uh there was a lot of a lot of names there a lot of figureheads there a lot of people you've known about for a long time and then i walked outside after like the first little segment or whatever it's called and matt hasselbeck introduced me to a man he was like, hey, Pat, this is Ryan Leaf. And I was like, holy shit, this is Ryan Leaf right now. And then you got a chance, or I got a chance to sit by you during another segment, kind of chit-chat with you and learn a little bit about you. And I don't think I knew enough about you going into that weekend, but after hearing you speak to the group, your opening sentence was, five years ago, I was sitting in a jail cell serving 32 months in prison. And here I am today. Let's talk about this. Let's figure this out. I got that. That was quite a message you just dropped on my head for somebody that didn't know much about you. You, I dig, I dug into you a little bit. There was a 30 for 30, I believe. You were this incredible prospect of a football player. Your entire life growing up was professional football, the dream, the goal, everything you were supposed to do. Well, uh, being a professional athlete was, I, I, I didn't care what sport, right? I wanted to be Ryan Sandberg and, or, or actually play shortstop for the Cubbies and, and, and be the turn two uh, uh, battery like that. Or, or my favorite sport was basketball. So I just wanted to be a professional athlete. However, that, that, that worked. And so I, uh, I was far and away the best athlete in, in my hometown, which isn't saying much. I'm from uh, a small town called Great Falls, Montana. Uh, I'm the only Montana never drafted in the first round of the NFL draft. There are more first round draft picks in the Manning family than the whole state of Montana. <laughs> ever. So I, I, uh, I, I definitely had those ambitions and those goals. I didn't, I didn't necessarily know that was something that was going to be, I didn't know how difficult it was. And I just kept fighting for that and going to Washington state really helped propel that for me because I got to be coached by the best in the business when it comes to coaching quarterbacks and, and uh, and get the opportunity. Uh, I just I just wasn't ready for what was about to happen, or what you would consider the NFL pressure cooker. Were you a meathead? Were you arrogant? What? Well, how would you describe yourself? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I I was I was confident, but but knowing more about myself now, I was what I was. I was, I was an egomaniac with a self esteem problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I cared so much about what others thought, um, but I thought so highly of myself and what I did. Uh, I, I I wasn't capable of like you know, living life on life's terms. I was really good at playing sports, but that was about it. I mean, you take me off the football field or the basketball court and try to have me interact with others and be social and, and do the right thing on that end of things. I was, I was really bad at that. What did you have an incredible jumper in basketball? What were you a big white guy in the paint? What were you? Uh... No, I, I could, I had a 36 inch vertical. I could fly. I could shoot from, from, from distance. I had good handles. Um, yeah, I basketball was my game, but, when I got to Washington State and I tried out for the basketball team, I, I found out pretty quick that, that I was going to be sitting on the bench <laughs> and, and uh, uh, not getting much playing time against the UCLA's of the world. Okay, so you go to Washington State from being, I assume, a very large fish in a small pond in Montana. I would assume you've had attention and spotlight since you were very young, I'd assume. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my mom could never really figure out why everybody in our town would – and in our state really would be talking about her son, right? And all eyes were on her son. She just never could really fully understand that. And so she was really worried about me and how I would be received and uh, interpreted and judged because she, she got to see me on a daily basis and she saw how I, how I handled life and, and, and how I would, I was super emotional and, 
um, and all the things. And she was afraid that everybody else was going to see that. And, uh, you know, we kept it under wraps for a, a good portion of it. But once you get to the NFL and that spotlight is as bright as it can be, it, you know, it's pretty well exposed. Well, before you get to the NFL, you have a, an incredible collegiate career. Obviously, led you to a Heisman finalist. Being in that conversation is something not a lot of humans have will ever receive, by the way. So that's an incredible thing. Then the draft comes up, right? You you put up remarkable numbers at Washington State. You're talked about being the next big thing, right? This guy is the next quarterback. It just so happens. You were also in the same draft class as a man named Peyton Manning. Uh, so the, a debate automatically starts ensuing on who the Colts will take first and who the Chargers will end up with. Both incredible quarterbacks that will be once-in-a-generation type talent. Did that type of pressure and conversation about to know that you're about to be very rich, you're about to have a lot of pressure put on you, you're being called this next great thing, is that when you really started to experience a change in your life or the way you were, or is it something that's just been evolving all along? Yeah, I didn't – I thought that was about right, you know, that I was, you know, either the first pick or the second pick in the NFL draft, that I was going to be successful. I had won championships at every level, right? I just assumed that it would play out in the same way. I worked really hard, but also things came to me pretty easy uh, in, in high school and in, in college and when I would play. So I, I, I think I just assumed it was going to be the same when I got to the NFL. It, it's a different world, right? It's it's the best athletes in this world. It's the 1% of the 1%, and it's really what you do from Sunday to Sunday. Not Because everybody who gets to this level is talented, They're just super talented. It's, it's what you do with the – and I battled the media and I battled my teammates and I didn't deal with failure well at all. Um, you know, Peyton led the, the league in interceptions his rookie year. I don't – there's no way I could have done that. I would have, I would have absolutely imploded if I had led the league in interceptions. He saw it as simply an opportunity to do it better the next time. He just had this mentality moving forward. And he also led the – broke the record for most touchdown passes as a rookie as well. So, I mean – he, he had the mentality. I had this uh, failure success like referendum around everything. Like either you were successful or you were a failure. There was no in between and there was no growing pains for me. And how I dealt with those failures is what ultimately ended my career in the NFL. Yeah, somebody just sent me a video of you <laughs> fucking – Letting a reporter in the locker room know, and like, <laughs> what, I did, I had never seen. It. Somebody just sent it to me literally this morning because they heard we were talking, and I was like, "Holy hell!" There's a lot of people that wish they could do that. It seemed yeah. like you were a person <laughs> that just kind of let it fly, and that's a that's an interesting. Is that the emotional side you're talking about whenever you talk about your mom and all this shit? Yeah, I mean, I was just that's how I reacted. Is is I tried to intimidate people and show them, you know, how big and strong and how much better I was than you because I was this big time football player. And there was this peon of a reporter in my eyes, the beat reporter who, you know, essentially kind of baited me with uh, um, an article he wrote the day before. And I was going to let him know who was in charge here. And uh, before the camera fully turned around, I picked him up and kind of threw him in the chair. <laughs> and I told him how it was. And I sounded like a, just a petulant child. And it's embarrassing. Junior Seau rushes in and, and pulls me out and puts me in the shower to calm me down. And I just also kind of thought that would blow over, but viral videos had just started, and this was one of the first ones, and this would, would this would characterize me the rest of my life. I was talking to a reporter today doing some radio, and they said, you know, you had a history of yelling at a bunch of reporters, and I was like, it happened once, you know, and that's, <laughs> it, that carries with you, right? Yeah, for and it, sure. And it defined me for a long time. Also, I, I took no accountability for it. I still blame the damn reporter and, and everybody else around it. it. It was all everybody else's problem, not mine. Okay, so the way you're speaking, it sounds as if you've had like a full coming. I don't want to say it's it sounds like a DMT thing, but it does. It sounds like you've had a wokeness in your life, a moment that has really made you reflect upon the human you were and the human you're going to be. What was that? Was there a rock bottom? Was it the prison sentence you got? Yeah. Like, how did that all come yeah. to be? Yeah, it was prison. And it, it wasn't initially prison, right? When I got to prison, I was just as miserable, if not more, than I'd ever been. What you go to jail uh, for? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a drug addict, and I was stealing pills from my community. And, really? uh, yeah, I got addicted to Vicodin through my orthopedic surgeries and used it to numb and take me away from the life that I was meant to live. Is that uh, while you were in the NFL? No, it happened afterwards. I wish I could blame my poor performance on a terrible drug. <laughs> <habit>. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was all natural. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I just, uh, when I got out, uh, I was, I was dealing with mental health issues. I was dealing with clinical depression and then social anxiety disorder. And, and, um, I chose to self-medicate rather than seek professional help. And because as a big, strong football player, we don't, we don't show vulnerability or, or, or transparency. You know, we hide it and we deal with it. We back ourselves into a corner and we fight our way out. That's, that's how it's always been. So I chose to deal with it on my own and, and that placed me in a prison cell, not, not only emotionally, but ultimately at the end, uh, literally. And, uh, and nothing changed. I got worse. I blamed everybody else. I took no accountability and lucky for me, my roommate, um, showed up and he was a, uh, Afghan Iraqi war veteran who had served in combat over there. And he had uh, done something that a lot of people had done in their lives. And that's drive drunk one night. And he just, he, he happened to kill somebody and he had been in there since he was about 23 years old. And I watched him every day, just try to better himself. Uh, he made amends for what he did. And he wasn't resolute with being this version of who he was. And I, I didn't get it. I thought he was stupid and this wasn't going to help or anything like that. And finally one day he was comfortable enough, I guess, to confront me on it and just simply said, I didn't understand the value that I had, not only the men in there, but but for when I got out and uh, he suggested we go down to the prison library and help prisoners learn how to read who didn't know how to. And I've had many of those, you know, come to Jesus moments in my life, coaches, mentors, people. And I just pretty much told them all to fuck off the whole time. <laughs> and uh, I can't tell you why in this moment I, I, I did it. I, I went down there. I I went begrudgingly. I remember walking down the hallway in my red jumpsuit thinking this is stupid this isn't going to help and doesn't he know how important i am you know the the guy in a red jumpsuit in a prison still thinks that about himself that's <laughs> that's the egomaniac part uh of what i was still living so i went and i walked into a room where there were men uh in a place where you're not supposed to show any vulnerability be completely vulnerable and say hey i, I can't read can you help me and I couldn't believe it because I think it's probably the first time I'd ever heard a, a man actually say, hey, I, I need help. Can you help me? I, I don't think I'd ever heard that before in my life. And so it, it, it quickly made me think of things a lot differently. And I continued to go back because it doesn't change if you if you don't keep it up. Like if you just go once and don't do it again, that's not ever going to change. It's like practice. So I continued to go. And before I knew it, uh, I come to realize that I was being of service to another human being for the first time in my life. First time. I used to think by playing football and Saturdays and Sundays, I was being a service to to people. That's just stupid. And uh, and no one was watching this, right? The media didn't know I was doing this. It wasn't about branding or marketing or any bullshit like that. This was just two guys that were dealing with a ton of adversity, helping one another out. And I continued to do it for months and months and months. And finally, uh, I realized that it was going to have to be the foundation of who I was when I got out. So that's your that's your moment. And I didn't know it was happening as it happened then seven years from removed from it i can look back on it and go okay oh yeah that that's the moment when i that selfless nature uh started to become a reality in my life first of all awesome just want to let you know absolutely awesome that that happened and that you had this full wokeness about yourself and how you're much more than just a business proposition for a lot of people which is probably how you felt whenever everything you did just revolved around business decisions right branding you mentioned saturdays and sundays it's all business everything's business this is the first time you had a genuine moment with somebody you didn't think they wanted something from you either other than your help which is probably a cool thing for you to reach inside with that being said what type of teacher were you were you a, were you a hard ass teacher like, <laughs> did you were you like, well, I it's hard to teach people. To, you take it for granted when you were young and learned how to read. So then trying to teach somebody phonically and like uh, understand how to say a word or actually read a word when they say it, they they could under they understood what it was. If you t if you said the word to them, they know what it is. But when then looking at it on a page, they, it was really difficult. So I had to kind of relearn how I taught. And I was I will say it. I I became a a, a very compassionate educator when it came to doing that, That's uh, awesome. and not like a a uh, coach uh, in coach speak where you get on top of people or get, you know, get in their business about not doing something because the moment you shame them at all in an environment like that, it's over, it's over, it's defensive nature and it's, and they won't come back. So that, that took me, uh, that took me quite a bit of time to learn how to do it the appropriate way. And I think it really helped me for when I got out and I started working with people in recovery and, and doing other things outside of that. 
and how I interact with individuals uh, and, and, and understand. That's amazing, man. That really is. You said, you said on the stage uh, at the college football seminar, you said on the stage to the room, I was probably a gigantic asshole to most of you, and I apologize for that. Let me hopefully regain your tr- or something, friendship or something like that. Is it crazy to think that you are a massive asshole in your own words to a lot of people, and then you teaching somebody an elementary thing, being like the most compassionate human on earth, is probably what you're going to be remembered for in the end of everything? Well, I hope so. I think that I think that's... You know that's part of the program, right? Is 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 being, is taking some personal accountability for, for who you were. That's what, that's what accountability is. Is is taking ownership in what you did, regardless of what anybody else. You know, maybe some of those reporters in that room that I dealt with 20 years ago were dicks to me too. But what can I do about? That? I mean, you know, I, I just make things worse by by being a dick to them in, in in response. So, you know, only thing I can control is how I react. And that was a perfect opportunity for me to make some amends to to individuals that I may have wronged, regardless of how they treated me or talked about me or anything like that. That was my opportunity. And that was my chance to be part of the solution and 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 and, and do my part in this. And I think that's the coolest thing about all of this, that we can break it down as simply as we can. We, you and I, everybody else, we have the power in any choice we make to deal with something in a positive and healthy way or make it worse, which is what a lot of us usually do. That's incredible. You're an inspiration, bro. This is a really cool <laughs> thing. This is a really, really cool thing. Can you still throw the ball at all? Can you still throw I can, Yeah, I can whip that thing around still. I know, that'll never change. <laughs> really? You still got yeah. it. How about your jumper? Can you can you still shoot? Yeah, I can still shoot. I can't jump, though. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I dunked it the other day still, so I guess, but not like I used to. I used to be able to fly. Do you reminisce? I used, win, I, used win, I used to win duck contests, man. It was it was that good stuff. White guy went a dunk contest. That's in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, 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 yeah. This, yeah. Was, this was down in Florida. Yeah, this was down in, with with Clyde Drexler and those guys watching me and judging me. I still I still got that stuff. You don't uh, obviously now is a time where you have to have a rear view mirror because you have to reflect on what got you to where you are right now and the human you are. Do you ever think about like? Do you hate Peyton Manning? Like, do you wish? I, do you wish you like if you had this mindset now? Whenever you were playing, I would assume it'd be a whole different ball game. And then Peyton Manning is ultimately the person that is always compared to your story. Always, they're like, remember when the right. thought was Ryan Leaf over Peyton Manning? Do you have any? It sounds like you've come to peace with anything, but for a, for a period of time in your life, did you hate Peyton Manning? You know, he's a guy that I probably could have resented a lot. But I, I tell you what. Uh, Peyton and I have known each other for 22 years. We started talking to each other when we were in, in college, our final years, because I think we knew where, where things were headed. And, uh, and we remained close. And my career did not go the way I expected it to. Uh, I thought I was going to be able to compete against him in the AFC for years and years to come. You know, we were going to play in AFC championships against each other. That's what I was expecting. So I don't have any ill will towards him at all because he did it about as right as you could as a, as a player. And he's been actually very, he's been a, a pretty special person in my life. He, he was, a lot of people left my life when things got bad, right? When I went to prison, you figure out who your friends are. And his family not only reached out to mine, but he did personally in, in the form of writing me a letter while I was in prison. So uh, we stay in contact now. And what's ironic about the whole situation is no matter how up and down my last 22 years have been and how meteoric his has been and where he's at right now, we're both pretty much at the same places in our lives where we have a family. We like who we see in the mirror. We're doing the things we want to do. We're both employees of ESPN now, apparently. <laughs> so I, I think it's a little ironic, but it will show people no matter how up and down your life is, you can always get up and you can always start over and you can always be in a place of peace and understanding. And, and I, 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 I take solace in that, that 22 years later, Regardless of the career he had or the career I had, we're both these flawed human beings trying to be better now moving forward, regardless of being a Hall of Fame quarterback or not. And I, you know, I take solace in that and I and, and I'm proud of him and I, I'm OK with me. So that's that, that's what makes it all right. Well, I'm proud of you, bub. I'm proud of <laughs> Thanks, Pey- bub. I'm proud of Peyton as well, by the way. That is such a Peyton Manning move. 
to well, he be- got you a ring, didn't he? No, no we, we lost. Yeah, <laughs> Drew Brees. Yeah. 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 We're teammates, though. We had a good time, a good guy. But that is a very Peyton Manning move to be like, it is. Go above and beyond to be like, hey, even though I am a robot of an individual when it comes to football, I am a complete robot. Everything has to be exact. Boom, boom, boom. I, I also take a lot of pride in being a good human. Writing you a letter. Do you still have that letter? Uh, I probably not. I was not in a good place. I think oh, fuck. I wish you would have been every, teaching every, people how to read <laughs> whenever you got that, because that would have been a cool thing to keep it was, around. It was early on. And, uh, my roommate watched me do it every day. Mail would come and I would, I wouldn't even open it. I would just rip it up and tear it up and throw it in the trash. I was so sick. I was so depressed. I was so self-loathing and angry. Um, the worst possible version of myself was what the first 26 months of that 32-month sentence looked look like. What is that called whenever you have to come off of a... Withdrawals. Withdrawals. Did you have bad withdrawals? In your, I never understood how they put drug addicts in jail. And then whenever you see on like uh, for the intervention show on A&E, when somebody's going through withdrawals, it is a terrible thing. And then I think about people who are imprisoned that are going through withdrawal. Did you have that situation that happened? Yeah, it was, it was difficult. Um, it was more psychological for me. I was more fearful of the actual anxiety around being in withdrawal. I, I don't really remember it too much. It, was, it took a couple of days. I was in solitary confinement when I first went in because I was just so out of it and saying – you know, terrible things like uh, wanting to harm myself. And so, I mean, I was, I was as mentally ill as you can, can imagine. I was insane. So uh, I don't remember it being as bad as it probably can be. I also didn't graduate to the next level of like heroin and things like that. I was Got still, it. you know, taking Vicodin at night just to help me sleep. But it was, it was such an addiction that I had to break into people's houses to get it. So, I mean, it was just the same as somebody who was using heroin. I just hadn't gotten to that point yet. Because uh, I didn't know a drug dealer, I was using my hometown as a as a pharmacy of sorts. So um, it wasn't as bad as it probably could have been. But I also don't know uh, how much I truly remember about that first week uh, in, in jail. Well, we're all happy that you've come out the other side a much better human. I mean, that's awesome. I got. We re- all are. You guys are. <laughs> No, we all are. Yeah. I think the whole world is happy that you come out the other side. I mean, maybe not the lady that you stole her Vicodin so you can sleep. But. Yeah, I had to probably apologize to her. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, No, but you've become a, an incredible human. Uh, and listening to you speak at the seminar, and you're getting back into the sports world, it's like the football world is welcoming you back in. That has to be a pretty special come full circle moment for you as well, right? I mean, you're going to be calling games, and uh, now you have a talk show every day. I mean, this is a pretty cool thing for you. No, it is. I mean, it's this is we, we put this in motion about, you know, four years ago. My, my wife and I kind of she asked me what I wanted to do. You know, like you, I, my foundation is based in recovery and, and being of service to others. But you also have dreams and goals. A lot of times you get and it, it's what what sent me sideways before my identity was a football player. Now, my identity didn't need to be a guy who's, you know, uh, in recovery. I can have these goals and dreams also and, and accomplish those. So we set out to do that. And we're in a position now where you're right. You know, who would have thought five years ago, as I was sitting in a prison cell, that I would now be working for ESPN and the Disney Corporation? And hey, me too, uh, man. I, I right? Mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's how, did, how did I how did I pass the background check? That's what I <laughs> <laughs> it's a Wikipedia, man. I was waiting. I was just waiting for like I called my agent and was like, hey, they know who they're hiring, right? And he said, yes. I'm like, it's not going to land on like the eighth person who works for HR. And he looks at it and goes, whoa, whoa <laughs> no, we can't hire this dude. <laughs> <laughs> so I was waiting for that to all play out. It, you know, just a ton of gratitude. Um, I get to call college football games, travel over the co- all over the country and do that. Um, be with my family. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm, amazing things happen for me when I do the next right thing. That's that's not lost on me, and I'm not oh, going to take this for line. granted, you know, because um, when I don't, when I make poor decisions and not do the next right thing, my life is a dumpster fire. I go to prison, so it's completely on the opposite end of the spectrum. But when I do the next right thing, like amazing things happen for me, not just run of the mill, OK, life in general, normal, but like amazing things if I if I'm willing to work hard and, and do the next right thing. So I don't take any of that for granted. I think you're going to do great, too. I was sitting next to you whenever we were sitting through a, a couple-hour analyst um, lecture on how to be better analysts. 
and listening to you say a couple of things. I think you're going to be good because I think what is forgotten is how dominant of a quarterback you were in college football, at least, you know? I think that can kind of get forgotten in the mix. So listening to you say stuff about quarterbacks and a certain play and thing, like behind the scenes there, nobody else really say I was sitting next to you. I think it's going to be fun to listen to you kind of get back into the game a little bit. Yeah, I'm excited because I think I think that's truthful too, right? Um, you know, when I go speak to uh, – I'm, I'm on my campus tour right now. I spoke to Toledo Monday night. I'm speaking – spoke to Maryland last night. I'm at Texas A&M tomorrow and Clemson on, on Friday. And I think a lot of people assume when I go into those things, I'm, I'm telling them what not to do, right? Like, if you split my life into uh, success and, and failure, like, to get where I got, 85% of my life is, like, a lot of success. And then there was this failure at the highest level that gets played to the point of, like, well, that's the story. And that, that isn't it. And these young men that I'm talking to are exactly where I was 22 years ago, sitting in a chair – uh, and that's why I think the story is so impactful, and I think it's why the coaches continue to ask me to come out and do it. And I, I really feel uh, a part of the, the college football landscape when I get to do stuff like that, and I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. That's awesome. Uh, the guys here are very intrigued whenever I said Ryan Leaf was coming on the show. They all have some questions. Is it all right if we do uh, a little around-the-room question here? Yeah, let's do a little Q&A. Hey, that's what we're talking about. Hey, a little Q&A yeah. here. Yeah. I can sling it too, by the way. I'm retired. I can still <laughs> sling it. <laughs> I could still sling it. Just in case you were wondering, perfect passer rating, Thanksgiving Day games, no big deal. Uh, go ahead, boys. Hey, Brian, uh, who's your favorite modern-day athlete to watch? Who do you enjoy watching? Um, Tiger Woods uh, still just has been the guy. I'm a go- I love golf. Um, but he's just he's a guy that just, if he's on, right, you turn the television on to watch him. Um, probably football uh, landscape. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, uh, he's he's a guy that that you know plays the position as as good as anybody else. Uh, kind of like how he conducts himself and things like that. And, but you know, Tiger Woods is a modern day athlete. I just infatuated with him because I love golf so much. I know how damn hard it is, and to watch him do it and be successful, especially this last year, has been pretty cool. Do you have a handicap? Six. Oh, so you're a real good golfer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You spend a lot of time golfing. I, I, I try, but uh, I got a 22-month-old at home, so I don't get out on the golf courses quite as often as I used to. That makes sense. I respect yep. that, by the way. Six is a hell of a handicap. Uh, Ryan, I asked the same thing to Maurice Corrette, who also had hell of a redemption story. Right. Um, when you went to prison, did just like the, the documentary The Longest Yard, did they recruit you to play for the football team? <laughs> It was like the first week I was there, and a guy on the cell block came up and said, hey, will you come outside? Uh, we play flag football. And I was like, I don't know what I was thinking or what I was – I went out. Yes, I went out. Uh, I was all-time quarterback, but it was strange, right? All of a sudden, I could hear the walkie-talkies squir- uh, squawking and the guards talking about, Leafs out here throwing the football. And <laughs> guards were coming around to watch. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm standing there in this red jumpsuit surrounded by barbed wire on just just god-awful dirt looking at the mountains I used to hunt in as a kid and absolutely just just a deep dive in depression just like you wouldn't believe and I, after we were done and I went back to the room I was just like I'm not I'm not going outside again I didn't go outside again for I went outside twice in 32 months Jeez. and I didn't realize it Holy at the time but again now i was making it about me and the guy that asked me to to come out came up to my room that 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 evening and said dude today was my birthday and it was the coolest fucking present i've ever gotten i got to play catch with an nfl quarterback and i still didn't hear it i still didn't hear it wasn't about me i still thought <laughs> i'm a fucking joke i'm throwing a football in a goddamn prison somewhere in a red jumpsuit and instead it was about this guy who He's going through the uh, a shit experience too, and it was his birthday, and he got to play catch with an NFL quarterback, and that's what made his day. I, I didn't see it. I completely see it now. It's about somebody else, not myself. But at the time, it it haunted me so much that I didn't go outside again for for like the length of my stay in prison. You should go back to that prison and go play catch with that guy again. <laughs> Just something to think about. Just something to think about. <laughs> So I yeah, bu- I don't think I think he's still there. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was all-time quarterback growing up, so I can get the pressures in there. I understand. Yep. 
That is crazy. The thought of you looking at, right, when you drive down the street and you see a prison, right? There's one up by where I live now. You drive past, you see it. I couldn't even imagine the thoughts that I would have if I was inside looking out. That, that had to be uh, quite a mental warfare there for you, honestly. Yeah, it, uh, it, it, was, it was sickening for me. Hey, all those it, things led to today, though, right? Yeah, they did. And that's why it's I, – I didn't, I didn't think I'd ever be able to tell a group of people or, or yourself or anybody that I would – that I was grateful for having spent 32 months in prison. I don't recommend it, but I am, I am, I am grateful for having experienced that in my life. How'd you throw it to that guy on his birthday? Pretty good. Were you slinging it in there or what? Yeah, man. I, it, dude, it's like, it's like a golf swing. Just learn, just replace the left hip with the right hip. Ball just flies out. I was throwing it around yesterday at Maryland practice. You know, come on, put it, put a Jersey on me. I can play, I can play four snaps and we'll call it a day. <laughs> awesome. Hey, uh, Mr. Leaf, uh, what do you want to be remembered for when it's all over? Well, not, not being called Mr. Leaf on a, on a podcast. <laughs> I know that. Um, a, hey, you know, listen, a, Ryan, uh, the, the human that just asked you that question <laughs> was tasked to put pin locations on the radio stations that we are about to broadcast in. And he got a couple states wrong. He put Colorado Springs in Utah, a pin in Utah. <laughs> he put Buffalo damn near in Maine. <laughs> I mean, so the person that is talking, I don't want you to think that this is a voice yeah. of any other human other than himself. All right. Yeah. It, uh, Mr. I, I just, I want to be Great remembered question. as, uh, I, uh, maybe I just, I don't, I don't care to be remembered, I guess is the best way to look at that. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't need that. I'm okay with, uh, however anybody thinks of me. And in fact, what other people think of me is certainly none of my business. So, um, I just want to be a good dad. I think that's the best thing that I could ever be remembered is a good father. Cause mine, mine was the best, you know, my dad's a two tour Vietnam veteran who built his own business and raised three kids and, um, is my hero. So if I can be anything close to what my dad was and it is to me, uh, then that, then I'll, then I'll be a success. That's awesome. Thank you, Mr. Leaf. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, do you think, um, what, Everything you achieved through football, all the success you had there, and then then everything that caused you to become a mentor to people who do fall off the tracks. Don't you think that kind of makes you like the perfect candidate to be a college football coach at some point? Would you? Is that something you think about in the future? I mean, I, I tried it, right? You know, I I, right. I went down and coached in West Texas, and I did the ultimate thing you can't do, and that's take advantage of those kids, right? I stole from them. Uh, I took their pain pills and. Uh, I don't. I don't think a athletic director should ever trust somebody like me, uh, to because that's that's the most responsibility of any person is to be a head coach to these young men in college because they can influence their lives like nobody else can. So, um, I, I think that the best way I can do it is to continue to go and speak on campuses and let the head coaches be the the head coaches that they are, and uh, and and just be part of the college football uh, landscape. And I think that's my best. Uh, way I can contribute and I don't know if I have the patience to be a coach mm -hmm. anymore I just I I couldn't I, I, I walk watch the coaches and I see the late nights and it's great to watch the kids achieve and do the things but I'm just like I man, I like the chance to go play golf you know <laughs> tomorrow I, I don't want to be on the ro road recruiting you know I want to I want to be doing some other things so I don't know if I have the patience for it but I think everything's worked out exactly the way it's supposed to how about whenever they had that cocktail party with ESPN are those situations tough for you well, not really. I mean, alcohol was never an issue for me. Got it. Um, but I, I don't drink. Um, I, I, I don't use any mood altering substances at all. I, I did what I was supposed to do that night. I showed up and I mingled with my new colleagues and my bosses and showed them that I was um, capable of, of working hard and, and being a part of the group. But then, you know, at 830 or whenever midway through, I was like, OK, now now I'm going to bed. Um, and other people went up and shut down the rooftop bar and things like that. And I, I don't need to, I don't need to do that stuff, right? I did enough of that stuff in my heyday. Uh, it's not things that I'm I'm not I'm not in fear of missing out on anything anymore. In fact, uh, I knew I was going to have to speak the next day too, and I wanted to be the best possible version of myself while I was up there. I tell you this, I've spoken all over the country in a ton of places. And I and I was as nervous as you, as you could get walking up to that stage. And I, I can't really remember what the hell I said to be honest. <laughs> you were good. You were good. You were All right. yeah. You were good. I, <laughs> I I respected it and appreciated everything you said up there. And I think you really moved some people too. I think you got a standing ovation. 
I think you. Yeah, yeah. you did. You had a standing ovation. It's awkward. It's awkward. I'm. I still have that uh, default setting that I'm less than. I heard it for so long that I was just this piece of shit. Uh, that I, I'm still kind of stuck in that. It takes still, still takes time. I got to be better at accepting compliments. When I hear somebody like, "Oh, that dude's a piece of shit," I'm like, "Yeah, that's that's about right. That's, 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 that's right." Um, and when somebody gives me a compliment, I'm like, "Yeah, are you, are you sure?" So I'm I'm doing better with that. It's it's you know if you if you saw me as I walked off stage and everybody started clapping and standing ovation, my head goes directly straight to my down. Feet. Yeah, you went yeah. straight down. Yeah, I yeah, thought I, I thought about that. I was it, like, show the it's, face. It's a it's a it's a muscle memory thing where I'm like, this doesn't this doesn't seem right. What they should be doing is booing me and flipping me the bird. That's what I'm. That's what's what I'm used to. Or and it's not true. And I got to get better at that. Well, good. I hope you do get better at because when I spoke at that same seminar, literally everybody sat down. When you spoke, well, you, you you asked him to sit down though. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? They stood when you spoke. That's all I'm saying. Ryan, now that the uh, dust is settled and you have some clarity in hindsight, do you have uh, like a favorite moment off the top of your head from your time in the NFL? Um, the NFL, you, you know, draft night. I think. I mean, my dream. Just are you kidding me? This little kid from Montana with his dad being drafted into the NFL, flying on a private jet to the city that you're going to be the, 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 you know, the, the franchise quarterback at. I think that's, you know, that's the first day. That's the beginning. What I didn't do is I didn't look at it as, as the beginning. I kind of saw it as like a accumulation of all the things I'd worked for and I needed to start over. Um, and then there were a couple games. I mean, for whatever reason, against Denver, against Mike Shanahan teams, I, I balled. There was a game at Mile High – the old Mile High Stadium where I just, you know, uh, I let it fly through for like 300 and some yards and three touchdowns on only 13 completions. And it was just, I had three, all three of my touchdowns were over 60 yards. So it was, uh, that's one of those games I look back at and go, oh boy, that was, that was a fun, cool day. Um, I can't wait. Uh, NFL Films is sending me my, my career highlights and I'm, I'm sure it's not that long, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, there's going to be some awesome plays on there that I'm going to be able to show my kid one day, I think. I had a lot of Montanimals on my teams in the Denver game was where they had to get a bunch of tickets for people. I assume you had a lot of family in the stands for that particular night as well. Yeah, it, 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 it was. Uh, Denver was the closest game. I didn't, yeah. you know, we didn't have a pro team where I'm from. So uh, I, my first NFL game I ever went to was Denver, Miami, and then Denver, Pittsburgh were the two NFL games I had ever been to before I, I went to the NFL. Got to feel good. Felt bad in the prison yard. Had to feel good in the mm. Denver Stadium, Mile High Stadium. Hey, yeah, huh? it felt, it felt good throwing that ball around against John Elway, team to go on and win the Super Bowl. You know, that was that was a pretty special day for me. And and the guys I got to play with, right? I mean, I, I got to play with some great players. I played with Junior Sale. I played with Rodney Harrison. Uh, I played down in Tampa under Tony Dungy um, with um, – you know, John Lynch and Derek Brooks and Rondé Barber and Warwick Dunn and Mike Allstott, all those guys. What, what a great group of guys. And I was in Dallas, and Wade Wilson was my was my quarterback coach, and I learned a lot. I was there. Uh, Darren Woodson was there. Um, Emmett Smith was my running back. I mean, pretty pretty special players in this league, and I got an opportunity to play with them. That was that was that was great. That is awesome. Last one here, Ryan. Ryan, was there ever a time that you hated the game of football or it was like tough to watch on TV after everything that happened? Yep, there was a time that uh, uh, I didn't I didn't even look at the NFL at all. I mean, I may have – college football's always kind of been dear to me, but still, it was it was toxic, right? And uh, it's taken time and for me to get over it. And the healthier I've gotten, the less power it holds because I remember – uh, of how much I enjoyed it and how much enjoyment it gave me and what it gave me. It gave me everything. It gave me my dream. I mean, so I get that um, that football was a was a part of that, but it really wasn't the football of it, right? It was uh, it was the outside influences that I let affect me because I'm not considered a bust by my peers, by my fellow NFL brotherhood, right? We, we get together. They don't, they don't look at me as a bust. They know how hard it was to get to where I was getting. The fact that I was the second pick in the draft actually holds more water with guys that played in the NFL than anybody else. The people that call me that uh, are fans and, and like media polls and things like that, that are meaningless to me yet. I let it affect me so much for so long. And now I just, I don't, I don't, what other people think of me, I don't care about or 
and it, it and it's none of my business. And that's why I think football has become such a special part uh, in my life once again. That has to be such a freeing feeling for you mentally. That has to be a free because yeah. it's holding you hostage, right? All that shit's holding you hostage. Yeah, but with, and one of the coolest things is that the, the NFL actually hired me about six months ago. To, I'm a coordinator for the NFL Legends community. So there's only 22,000 of us, Pat, right? There's only there's only 22,000 of us who have ever signed NFL contracts and we're on 53-man rosters. That's unbelievable to think that. I asked him a, a deeper question. How many years did you play in the NFL? Eight. Perfect. That was the question I asked. How many players have played eight or more years in the NFL? Guess, how, guess what that number is. Well, if 22,000 have ever played... I'm going to go down to, I'm going to say 11,000. No. 1,000. 1,000 players have played eight years or more. That's it. You're, you're one of 1,000 wow. in the world ever. I, that's, uh... yeah, you're goddamn right. <laughs> yeah, goddamn right you are. Be proud of that, brother. Hey, that's an insane stat. Because you did walk up to me immediately and have me sign up for the NFL Legends community. I was like, no, no, Ryan. I'm already an NFL legend, bud. I already get the emails. I already went and yep. did a little. Uh, there was a, a commissioner uh, yep. round table thing that I went to. I didn't say anything. I'll let the old head say more than I did because I didn't know much. But, yeah, I'm part of the Legends community. I like it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a way for guys like myself to help guys transition. Yeah. Uh, because no matter if you've played 18 years and won Super Bowls or played two years, the transition is, is, is extremely difficult. And, right. um, and we need people to help guide us through that. I just, it, what, it didn't exist when I left, and uh, I'm so glad the NFL has is, is, is made something like this, and I'm glad I'm, I'm a part of it, and I'm a coordinator, and I can help these guys. So no one's ever as miserable as I was. I, that's, that's the main goal. And NFL Films is a pretty big part of this whole thing. I did, uh, I did like three podcasts with NFL Films. They filmed something. The, one of the head guys who used to be Sable's producer, the original yep. Sable's producer, is pretty yeah, big in the NFL. Right-hand man. So, yeah, it's, the NFL is full steam ahead with this. Tracy Perlman is uh, at the forefront with, with uh, Troy Vincent um, mandating this process. And uh, – uh, it's it's something really really special to be a part of. Yeah, I, I I circled all the all the NFL guys in the room when we were in Charlotte and got them all to sign up. So I my boss <laughs> thinks I'm doing a pretty good job. That <laughs> boy Ryan, well you are doing a pretty good job, not only at work but in life. Uh, I, I'm honored to have met you. I'm thankful you came on this show. I think people are going to really enjoy this. And although you don't want to be remembered, I hope you're a man who's remembered for changing his life and changing other people's as well. I think you're going to kick ass in the booth. Your radio show is beautiful. I'm sure these speaking engagements are going to increase as you continue to go on. Your story is a great one, brother. You can uh, motivate a lot of people. Congrats on everything, and thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Leaf.